Uh, our next speaker is making his first appearance at a Hillsdale event, uh, though we have long been admirers of his from afar. Uh, we're delighted that he's uh, able to be here uh, with his wife, Julie. Thank you for coming. Uh, David A. Clark, Jr. is the sheriff of Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. Prior to becoming sheriff, he had a long and distinguished law enforcement career in the Milwaukee Police Department. Beginning as a patrol officer, he became a detective and then joined the Homicide Division where he did impressive work. Uh, it turns out he's really good at catching felons and murderers, and <laughs> we thank you for that. Uh, because he was so good at what he did, he continued uh, to be promoted to lots of high-level positions. And then in November of 2002, he was elected to his first four-year term as sheriff, winning almost two-thirds of the vote. Uh, in the most recent election in 2014, um, almost 80% of voters pulled the lever for him, which tells me that law-abiding citizens like it when criminals end up in jail. Um, a summa cum laude graduate of Concordia University in Wisconsin, he is also a graduate, a graduate of the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia, and the recipient of a master's degree in security studies from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. Um, so this is an impressive list of accomplishments and accolades to be sure, but I have to tell you as a fellow hoopster, um, there was another item on his bio that really stood out, which I have to mention. He was a member of the 1973 Marquette University High School varsity basketball team that won the state private school championship. So I think that's, that's quite impressive. Um, please welcome to the podium, Sheriff Clark. Thank you so much. For that wonderful introduction, that uh, did that for my wife. Uh, that's a little inside joke that goes back to our church. Uh, we go on Sunday, and everybody that takes these are directional mics, but everybody that takes the podium at church, first thing they do is bring these down. And I always say, why does everybody bring the microphones down when they get up there? So I did this. I did this for her. Okay. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> um, Wow, this is amazing, it really is, uh, to see so many of you. Let me start with a couple of ground rules. First of all, I've come a long way. I get invited all over the country now uh, to speak on some very important issues. And I have, many of you seen me on TV. As a matter of fact, sometimes I think that's my real name is that guy from TV. Tell a lot of people or you know introduce themselves. Hey, you're that guy on TV. So now every once in a while, my wife at home she'll be David, David, and I, she doesn't get any response. She comes on, didn't you hear me? And I said no. She said I've been yelling David at the top of the stairs. I said oh, you should have just said you're that guy from TV, and you would have got my attention. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I've been across this country met a lot of great people. And Hillsdale College reached out to me a year ago, April, and invited me to come and speak at this conference. I had heard of Hillsdale College. Uh, I knew it was in Michigan. I knew it's lean conservative, <laughs> probably more than leans. But uh, <laughs> outside of that, I didn't know too much about it. But I did, and I said, yeah, sure, I'd like to do that. And then I heard it was going to be in New York. I said, well, why is it New York? I said, that school's in Michigan. And my executive assistant said, I don't know. It's, it's in New York, and uh, it's at the Waldorf Astoria. I said, you better call and tell them yes today. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank Hillsdale College for standing true to your principles, OK, and, and staying this institution of higher learning, of academic rigor, challenging your students to be curious, making it OK for them to dissent, to ask questions, to challenge prevailing orthodoxies. 
Unfortunately, unlike many of our colleges and universities today, which are nothing more than laboratories of liberal indoctrination, and I think that we're doing a disservice to the generations coming after us because they won't be able to critically think. They'll be good at being told what to do, what to think, how to think, how to say it, what to believe in. You can get a robot to do that. You can just program it with our technological capability now. But as Dr. Arn indicated, we're human beings. And we didn't get this country to where it's at today, except for the fact that people dreamed big, that people challenged prevailing orthodoxy. Remember at one time we thought the world was flat? Somebody had to come along and challenge that. Remember the ridicule? They were made a laughing stock. What do you mean a new world? You'll fall off the edge of the, the edge of the earth if you travel too far. But somebody dreamed big. Somebody challenged that, which was scary at the time. I mean, if you think about it, our, 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 the boats back then were nowhere like they were today. And to get out on the big ocean, a long way away from land and have things go bad. You thought the disease set in, it killed many of the people. But somebody still dreamed of a bigger world, a better world. But in order to do that, you have to challenge people. And that's what I mean when I say our colleges and universities no longer do that. And it's such a disservice. So uh, the students in here that are currently in school, raise your hand, please. Just want to take a look. OK, a couple of you. I know there's some grads here as well. Uh, take notes, because there's going to be a test after this. <laughs> and it's going to be homework. OK, so if you thought you we're catching a break coming here for this conference this weekend. I got bad news for you. <laughs> but for the grads, uh, you folks don't realize, maybe you do, I shouldn't say that. I don't want to take it for granted. You don't realize how fortunate you are to be able to attend this institution, um, eat it up, challenge them, soak it all in. And when you're done, come away with an attitude that you're going to do something good for this world. And too many people, and I get asked this all the time, too many people want to change the world. And I, I caution them, and I say, try to change people. Everybody you come across, you can make a difference in their lives. That's kind of how I wear this uniform now. I don't try to change the world. Every time I meet somebody, every time I get a chance to help somebody, but sometimes the tiniest things, you've made a difference in their life, you've made a difference in their world, and every time you take the opportunity to do that as you go through life in these positions that you're going to be in for the grads and for the students here, you'll change the world, but you do it one person at a time. Thank your parents. And Go back, help the school, thank your teachers and everybody else for providing that pathway for you to reach your human potential. Because that's what education is supposed to be. It's how I looked at it. It's how my parents looked at it. I wasn't the best student until later on. The light didn't go on for me until I, I went out and finished my undergrad degree and, as was indicated, graduated summa cum laude. In my master's, my graduate program, the light finally went on, but at least it did. And I remember how proud my parents were when I got my master's degree later in life, but my mom always wanted me to have a master's degree. I don't know why. <laughs> but I told her I would. And I remember when I walked across that stage out in Monterey, California, and I came off and when the ceremony was over I went to where my wife and my my mother 
and then her parents were, and my mom was in tears. Because I told her I would finish one day that way, and I did. I wasn't even thinking about it at the time. So that's why I say make sure you thank individuals as you move through this world. Because they're all trying to help you. They really are. Uh, some of the ground rules, like I said, I came a long way and at great expense. I didn't walk, and I'm not sleeping at a bus shelter. So somebody had to finance getting me and my wife out here. And I want to make it worth your while. But at the same time, you know, I don't come to poke anybody in the eye with a sharp stick. But I do speak my mind. And sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. I think I'm in pretty good company here. I think. But nevertheless, I don't want to paint this broad brush and think that everybody in here agrees with me and everybody in here, you know, has heard about me. And, and th that's not important. I'm just from one school of thought. And I believe in most of the things that we talk about in this world. Let's just take the country. All of these issues, right, whether it be immigration, foreign policy, there's not really a right or wrong. It's just schools of thought. I just happen to be from one of those schools of thought, which I can articulate. I can tell you why. All right? I don't parrot talking points. I don't do well with talking points. As a matter of fact, when people engage me in a conversation and it starts out, where they're just parroting talking points. My first, you see me do it on TV every once in a while, I'll say, look, put the talking points away and let's have a conversation here. All right? I'm just from one school of thought. I'm not right on any of this. I don't think I'm the only one that knows. I don't think I'm the smartest person in the room. I don't need to be. I'm just from a school of thought, and I can articulate why. I have formed my own opinions. I have formed my own positions on these things, and I can back it up. doesn't make me right, but I can say mine has foundation. Those are talking points. There's no foundation. You heard somebody say that, and now you're just repeating it. I'm thinking, does this person critically think, or do they just pair of talking points? Because I like to have robust debate. I believe in dissent. Sometimes I think Courage, and we hear that a lot, courage. I think courage sometimes is having dissent, but that's leadership. But if you don't challenge me from time to time, and I don't do likewise, we're never going to get over these. What do we do about immigration? What do we do about this economy? What do we do? Because everything delves into politics. And in my experience, once it, something hits the political realm, I go, well, <laughs> that's over. So if you don't agree with some of the things that I say, that's fine. We, I wasn't invited here for a debate. I was invited to share some thoughts with you, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to get into it right now. But I just wanted you to know that. Uh, and as you watch me and this national stage, which I'm on now. I didn't ask for this, but it's a mission now. It really is. And sometimes a mission is a calling. I mean, when I put this uniform on for 38 years now, this was a mission to make my community my hometown. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to make it a better place, to be able to serve people in your hometown, to be elected by the people. Say so we want you in this role in our representative democracy to represent our interests and I'll go do it. There's no higher honor. There just isn't. There is no higher honor than to wear the uniform of the United States and go and defend freedom. There is no higher honor. And every once in a while, I like to challenge people when we're having these discussions. And you'll see how, as I get a little into this, how, how it'll all come together. I, 
people say, Sheriff, what do we do about this? What do we do about all this? And I say, what are you willing to die for? And stops people right in the tracks. What are you willing to die for? Can you tell me? I mean, most people say my kids, right? My family, things like that. A soldier would tell you my country. I think for the last 38 years, I've told you what I'm willing to die for, my community. And in law enforcement, you know, we don't get into this to die, but we will if we have to. We just want to know that it's worth it because we're going to leave people behind. We're going to leave friends, spouses, children, parents. My parents are still with me. We're going to leave them behind. And I've dealt with that stuff, the cops organization, concerns of police for survivors. It's a group that they define as the group you never want to be a part of. You don't ask to join cops, cops organization. Your spouse or sibling or someone who's killed in a line of duty. And I've worked with those people. I've seen the grief. I've seen the pain. I've seen the suffering. The people left behind. And it hurts for a long time. But this organization wants to know that there's somebody there. That's why I am intimately involved in it. And I watch and I say to myself sometimes, what must the people who end up on a memorial wall, by the way, how many professions, for lack of a better word, have memorials dedicated to people killed in the line of duty? Three, cops, firefighters, and soldiers. That's it. Think about that. That's what this country has said, how much we value your service, that if you should perish in a line of duty or overseas fighting for freedom, we're going to put you on a memorial wall. We're going to memorialize you for eternity. Think about that. And in Washington, D.C., at the Law Enforcement Memorial, Judiciary Square, the names of 20,000 officers who have been killed in the line of duty. 20,000. And as I watch what's happening to my profession, I ask myself a lot, what must they be thinking? They died for this? And then you wonder why the cops across America have stepped back? Yeah, they have. I don't blame them. They got mortgages. They got families. They got kids. They want to see through college, maybe walk down the aisle. They want to have that all go up and smoke because of something that goes tragically wrong, which will in our world. That's what policing is. It's dealing with the unknown get a call for service. You don't know when you get there what's going on and you don't know what's happening and you don't know how it's going to end. But you go. So I sat up here several years ago and watched this incident unfold in Ferguson, Missouri like many of you. And I watched some very powerful people in the United States trash the reputation, the character, the service, the integrity, the honor of the American police officer. And I thought, wow, really? When Darren Wilson defended his life under the rule of law. It allows us to do that. Big believer in the rule of law. And he had to kill Mike Brown. That was tragic. 
Something went horribly wrong, but not because of Darren Wilson. But something went terribly wrong. And I watched people converge on the unknown city of Ferguson, Missouri. I'd be willing to bet, I'd be willing to bet, before that fateful night, if I would have given you a map of Missouri, just the outline, and said, point to where you think Ferguson, Missouri was, I'd be willing to bet less than 10% of you, and that's probably large, wouldn't have been able to even get close. So now all of a sudden, these people converge after this tragic situation, which isn't the first time it's happened. This isn't the first time a law enforcement officer had to use deadly force. So yet, and I ask myself, why this time? These people were waiting. These cop haters, these anarchists, they were waiting for one of these to turn into a political construct. This didn't happen by chance. And I sat up and listened to some very powerful people trash us. And that's what made this time different than the war on cops in the 1960s. Many of you may have remembered that period of time. It was the same thing. It was the same people. It was the Students for a Democratic Society. Anarchists. Cop haters. Why do they go after the cops? Because we're the most visible symbol of the rule of law in your community that's visible every single day. And they go after us to weaken the police into such a state, to immobilize the police into such a state of weakness that we no longer have the nerve to enforce the law. That's their goal. All of this other stuff is a smokescreen. All of it, the racism, the traffic stuff, it's all a smoke screen. These anarchists know if they're going to bring this country down, they have to attack the rule of law. Who stands to defend the rule of law? It, we're on the front lines. We're not at the end of it. We're on the front lines of it. Weaken us first and then move on to the next layer. We've seen this. I studied the movement. What was different this time is back in the 60s, you didn't have powerful people chiming in, mainly the political class is what I'm talking about. That's what made this one different. And it just got to a point in the days after Ferguson, Missouri, in America, let's face it, America did not witness its finest hour, the rioting that ensued. And I heard people making excuses for the rioting. To which I replied, you have to find a more socially acceptable way to deal with your frustration than rioting. And I heard the President of the United States say he understood. He understood the rioters. I didn't. I don't know what those businesses did. I don't know what the good law-abiding people of Ferguson did to deserve to have their town burned down. And then all these vultures left. Left the good people of Ferguson to have to sift through the ruins and try to put their lives back together. And they were gone. On to the next city. On to the next incident. And this thing grew and now it's this political construct that I saw coming two years ago. Matter of fact, I renamed it coming to a city near you. That was before Baltimore and New York and Eric Garner. Those are tragic situations. But there's a common thread weaving through all these incidents. People tend to forget about. And most of these interactions, I said most, I'll say 98%. I'll get to some of the ones that aren't. You had individuals 
who had no respect for authority. You had individuals who would not comply with a law enforcement officer's lawful command. You have a duty as a citizen of the United States. You have a duty. You know what a duty is? To abide by a law enforcement officer's lawful command. In other words, they throw the takedown lights down, right? The blue and red. You got to pull over. That's complying with the demand. You can't take off. When an officer says, drop the weapon or, or let me see your hands, you have to do it. And when you don't, some bad things are going to happen. And when those bad things happen, the people deserve a transparent investigation. But I want these officers judged not by the pleas of an angry mob. I want these officers judged by the rule of law. What does the rule of law say about this officer's actions? Not what you think should happen, not what you think should happen, not what you think should, what does the rule of law say? And it's very clear. But that's not the standard anymore, it's political now. And in my estimation, the six officers who were charged in the Freddie Gray incident in Baltimore, Maryland, they're political prisoners. There was no, <laughs> no basis whatsoever under the rule of law to charge those officers. None. So you had a, an overactive state's attorney, district attorney, whatever they call him in, in, in Maryland, who was on a political tour. She was going to try to make it right for the cop haters. She said when she announced the charging, I hear you. Your time is now. It's not how I want Lady Justice talking. I want Lady Justice to hold that scale up. You've seen it, right? And we'll weigh the evidence. We'll listen to the witness testimony. And we'll look at all of this. And that will determine what happens. That's the country I want to I wanna live in. Sometimes we're wrong. No doubt about it. Cops aren't perfect. We don't need to be perfect. You know what I tell my people every day, Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office? I don't demand perfection. I demand excellence. And more times than not, that's what I get. I said more times than not. I didn't say every time. Sometimes we make mistakes. The law allows us to make mistakes. In other words, Cop pulls somebody over or goes to jack somebody up standing on a corner, a group of guys, and it's dark, and the officer goes up there thinking safety first, and he's looking at hands, and he's watching all this. This is all what your training and experience. That's what I want him to rely on. And they see some dark object in an alley or at night, and they think it's something that might be used against them, and they use deadly force, and it turns out to be a cell phone. I'm not saying that's okay. It's called a mistake. That's not a crime. In the United States, we have a system to deal with that, and it's called tort law. You sue the city, you sue the county, you sue the agency, because in the United States, that's how we try to make people whole. It doesn't bring them back. And it's not necessarily the best system, but that's how we make people whole in tort law. We give them money. We don't charge people criminally for a mistake. So I decided that I had had enough. And that if somebody didn't stand up and start pushing back, 
on this false narrative that was starting to take hold about the American police officer, I said, this profession's in trouble. And so I took on some pretty powerful people. And let me tell you, you don't do that at the drop of a dime. You don't take on the President of the United States. You don't take on the United States Department of Justice Attorney General for nothing. These people wield power. Plus, those are respectful positions. But so is mine. And so I saw this as a mission. And fortunately for me, I had the use of some platforms because I don't have my own platform. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> and with those platforms, I got to spread my message and start to defend the integrity of people who put on this uniform on the front lines and go out into the communities every day to make it a better place, risk their lives in doing so, and they deserve my support because I send those men and women out every day not knowing if they're going to come back, and they deserve your support as well. Now, I'm at ground level. I'm in the belly of the beast. I still go out on the street. I still make stops. It's in my blood. I tell people, if you cut me, I don't bleed red, I bleed blue. And I decided that I was going to spend the rest of my time defending this profession, defending those folks who go out there to make your communities a better place. What I'm talking about when I say I'm at ground zero, m many of you, and again, this might be a, a false assumption, but I'm going to assume m most of you don't live in the American ghetto. Yeah, I said ghetto. And the left doesn't like that word. You know why? Because they like to cleanse the language. Because they, then I guess it doesn't look so ugly. So we cleanse the language. We call it what? Economically depressed. We call it central cities. No, it's a ghetto. And I call it a ghetto for a reason. Riots are not caused by police use of force. Riots are caused by the failure of government. Riots are caused because liberal Democrat politicians in these urban centers cannot do the hard work or will not do the hard work of solving urban pathologies that build up over time and lead to riots off of something like a police use of force that's nothing more than a catalyst to a simmering situation. Inescapable poverty in the ghetto. Massive unemployment. In the city of Milwaukee, the city, the black unemployment rate, black males, 33%. The national average for black male unemployment is 15. So we're nearly three. We're over twice the unemployment rate. So you have men in their prime working years sitting around idle. What are they going to do when they're sitting around idle? Part of the human condition. You're going to find some way to get by. And it's not going to always be socially acceptable. Selling drugs, robbing 7-Elevens, Another urban pathology, crime-ridden neighborhoods, ineffective parenting, 
fathering kids out of wedlock. These are not necessarily all urban pathologies. These are pathologies that when you stick them all in one area of the city, what do you think is going to happen? So when these people in the political class can't solve these problems, what do we do? We send the police. That's what we do. With all the crime and all the violence, somebody has to go down there and give the overwhelming majority of good, law-abiding black people some sense of a peaceful life. Somebody's got to go down there and do it, so we send the police. Officer, go down there and keep those people from killing each other, raping, robbing, and pillaging the community. And we do. We use our training. We use our experience to go down there and do that very tough job. Because they won't, the political class won't do their job. Because I always say, if you, and that's what we're doing now. We're trying to fix the police. And I keep telling people, stop trying to fix the police. Fix the damn ghetto. <laughs> Ask yourself why we need so much assertive policing in the American ghetto. Why does policing work in your community? We're talking about it at the table over here. Because in many of your communities, you have what's called informal social controls. Informal social controls keep crime and violence in check. What's an informal social control? Effective parenting is an informal social control. Those are your kids. You take care of them. Functioning schools are an informal social control. We all know that kids who are educated are less likely to engage in some of the abhorrent behavior that we're seeing. It's an informal social control. You have functioning schools in your community. In your community, most people are employed, supporting their family, when you're at work, guess what you're not out doing? Committing crime. A job is an informal social control. Better lifestyle choices, which is what I talk to young people about all the time. Everywhere I go, make better lifestyle choices. These things that you're doing today are going to have a profound effect on you later on. Make better lifestyle choices. I don't sit up and, and talk to young people and say, oh, life's not fair and, you know, racism and make better lifestyle choices. Nobody held a gun to your head and told you to join this gang. Use these drugs, make better lifestyle choices. But see, there's not a lot of effective parenting and all this stuff coming together, mentoring and leaders to show the way, right? Role models, what we call them. There aren't any role models. They're all in prison, in and out of jail. And they see that every day, and it becomes part of the landscape, and they think this stuff's normal. So then I come along, and I embrace being a role model in my community, and the left tries to make me the bad guy. I'm the bad guy. And I say, oh, really? And I look, and I say, I'm employed been employed for the last 45 or so years. My wife and I have a home. We built that home from the ground up. I have my education. I have a graduate degree. I, what do you mean I'm the problem? If the worst that happens to many of these kids you got to tell this to the left. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But if the worst that would happen if they looked at me and said, I want to be like that guy is what? They turn out to be a conservative? <laughs> because that's what they're really afraid of. That's really what they're afraid of. But I think it's a shame. So we send the police. And when you send the police, it is a high-risk 
proposition. I'll tell you why. Because we do two things well. I didn't say this is the only thing we do. We do two things well. We keep the peace. We enforce the law. That's in our wheelhouse. We do other things. That's in our wheelhouse. If you need that done, call us. For all this other stuff, I say, don't call us. No, I'm serious. I talk about informal social controls. Dr. Arn and I were, were, were talking about that, how he can get involved in some things going on with the kids at school. You don't need the police if you have effective parenting. My mom and dad didn't need the police when it came to me. <laughs> Matter of fact, sometimes I wish, when I knew when my mom gave me that, wait till your dad comes home, I was hoping the police would arrive first. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. You know, my dad didn't beat me unnecessarily. It was just the fear. That look. The fear was enough. That's why all my mom had to say was, wait till your dad gets home. That's all she had to say. That's all she had to say. Effective parenting. You folks know about it, but I'll tell you right now, in the ghetto, it is in short supply. So you send the police. Remember, we keep the peace and we enforce the law. If there's a violation of the law, we have to take action. And we can do any number of things, right? But I'll tell you right now, if it comes down to giving a lawful command and it's not followed, we can't walk away. I watch the stuff going on in schools. You've seen some of the incidents with law enforcement officers in school. And first of all, I tell people when they say, oh, look, at did you? I said, well, first of all, I said, Something happened that caused that officer. I'm not making excuses. Somebody didn't comply with a law enforcement officer's lawful command. Young lady, you got to leave the classroom. First of all, the teacher told her to leave the classroom. She effed the teacher, right? Teacher calls the principal. Principal comes in. Young lady, you have to. She effs the principal. Call the cops. Remember when I said when you call the cops, high risk. You can't F the police. We can't walk away. The teacher walked away. Well, I can't. She won't listen to me. The principal, well, she won't listen to me. The cop can't say, that's what I would have done. The other cop has said, no, it's your student. She won't listen to me. You handle it. There's no violation of the law here. That's what we're doing. She's just sitting in the desk and walk away. But we don't get to do that. First of all, I think it's a sad day to have police officers in school. One of the first things I did as sheriff, I took them out, I took my deputies out of schools. I said, they don't belong there. It's not our, it's not one of our core functions. And don't give me this, well, hey, you know, uh, cops can establish relations. With, forget about that. When I was in school, <laughs> you, know, you know who the teachers relied on? Mom and dad. Not the cops, but we think this is a neat thing. Let's put the cops in school. It's not a neat thing. You put these cops in these situations, and they use force. And I'm not making excuses for it, but some of the incidents that I saw, I said, wait a minute. He had to use force. His lawful command was not adhered to. He had to use force. But here's where we have to judge now on its reasonableness. Not could he have done something else. It's not what the law says. The law says we judge officers' actions on reasonableness. Did what he, is what he did under those circumstances reasonable under the circumstances? Not what you would have done. Not what you would have done, because I heard people, well, I would have done, I said, but you didn't get called, we did. And was it reasonable? And here's another thing about force. It's never pretty. It's not designed to be pretty, it's designed to be effective. And we teach our officers reasonably to end these confrontations quickly. Why? So they don't end up like Darren Wilson and Mike Brown. It doesn't end up in having to use deadly force. 
So you end it quickly. You decentralize. You see a cop taking somebody down to the ground? I heard it the other day referred to as body slam. No. We teach officers to decentralize. Get them on the ground or get them up against a wall so you may, can maintain control. Now, I don't expect you folks to agree or understand that. But the training is all certified by the state, the way we train our officers. Sometimes officers will do something they shouldn't do. Well, then that's my job. I sent a sergeant, one of my sergeants, to prison five years ago. Why? For beating a handcuffed prisoner in the back of a squad car. I'm not putting up with that nonsense. We're better than that. But see, that's my job. And I'm elected, by the way. The people in Milwaukee County want me making these decisions. And if I start making decisions that they're not happy with, they'll get rid of me. They'll get rid of me real fast at the election, at the, at the ballot box. But as a law enforcement professional and as an executive, I get to be one of the judges or arbiters of that action, which is why they call me all the time on TV. What do you think about this? And I use my experience having done that, having done it. I've been there. And I know how these things can spiral out of control in a hurry. If you don't end it quickly, like I said, it's not supposed to be pretty. And everyone, oh, did you see it? I said, it's not supposed to be pretty. It's supposed to be effective and reasonable. When cops get out of line, we have a process to deal with that. But here's what I don't want. I don't want somebody who has never done this job, who's not for one day in their life done it. I don't want them telling us how we should be doing this. Folks, that'd be like me trying to transform the medical community. I've I know nothing about medical science. I've never done that a day in my life, and I'm going to come in and say, well, the doctor should have done this, and how come the nurse didn't? I don't know what I'm talking about. I need to let the medical community figure that out. President Obama needs to let the law enforcement community and at the local level figure this out. And just because some cops go to the dark side, and they do some things that, yeah, Walter Scott, South Carolina, ugly. I said it on TV. I said I was appalled by that, and I was. I said, I've never seen that in my life. I, mean, I know the difference between good policing and bad policing. And he was charged with a felony, and he'll pay for that. But because of these aberrations, and that's what that is, that is an aberration, we want to change an entire entire profession because of an aberration. Do you know how dangerous that is? Because these people have not thought through the law of unintended consequences by trying to change this profession. It's going to have a profound impact on good law-abiding people. You know who pays the highest toll when you declare war on police officers? Good law-abiding minorities in the ghetto pay the highest price. The president knows that. Eric Holder knows that. And then you want to tell me that black lives matter? Oh, yeah? As far as I'm concerned, the group of people who truly care about the lives of other black people the police officers who go down in these communities every day to serve and protect them. That's who really cares about black lives. And if black lives truly mattered to these, I had to catch myself there. If black lives truly mattered to these imbeciles, they would be Right now, 24-7 protesting in the city of Chicago, where in the first three months of the year, over 150 people have been murdered, mainly black, 
84% increase over last year's first three months, and last year was bad, and over 800 people have been shot in the city of Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, those sound like casualties after an armed conflict over in the Middle East. 150 dead, 800 wounded. Sounds like a fierce firefight, doesn't it? And here it's happening in the great city of Chicago. One weekend, not too long ago, 37 dead in a weekend. Same with Baltimore. After the Freddie Gray, when the police backed off, Memorial Day weekend, 37 people murdered. And what do we do? We kind of, oh, that's terrible. Oh, that's. Well, if it's so terrible, then lay off the police. Because the police are the last line of defense down there for many of these folks. And the, like, I'm going to say it again, the overwhelming majority of people down there are good, law-abiding people. they got to be defended. And it's only the cop that's doing it. It's not the politician doing it. It's not the cop hater doing it. It's not the anarchist doing it. It's not Black Lives Matter doing it. It's the American police officer. And if we want order restored to these cities where crime has taken a steep spike, if we want order restored and if we really care about these folks, then get behind me and get these people to back off the American police officer. They'll go back to work. Here's what's happening. Your best policing is self-initiated policing. It's not answering the 911 call. If 911 has to be called, usually it's over, right? The incident already occurred. Got my house broken into, my car stolen, someone stuck a gun in my face and took my wall. It's over. Your best policing is self-initiating, self-initiated policing, where that cop goes in and he or she develops the reasonable suspicion, because I believe in this Constitution and the rule of law, we have to have reasonable suspicion to stop somebody. And they look and they develop that reasonable suspicion. Hey, look at that car over there. And by the way, it's got expired plates. There's your reasonable suspicion to pull it over. The courts have already ruled the subjective intent of the officer, they said, does not matter. They say, was the stop legal? Yes, he had expired plates. Now, you might say, well, that's just a small thing. No, it's not. And I'll tell you what you're going to find with self-initiated policing. When you make these stops, you're going to find people wanted on serious felony warrants that you can take to jail, get them off the street. You're going to find weapons possessed illegally that might be on the way to or were involved or away from some sort of armed robbery or shooting. And you can do the ballistics test and all of that. You're going to find illegal drugs. It is a treasure chest of criminal activity self-initiated. No one sent the cop over to pull that car over. No one sent the cop over because those jamokes were hanging out on the corner. And the neighbors are calling and saying, please get those drug dealers off my corner and we go and do it and then we're the bad guy. According to Black Lives Matter. Well, there's not any real self-initiated policing going on right now. We can't make cops do self-initiated policing. We can only make them go to the 911 calls. So when people say that cops are doing this on per no, they're not. You can't blame them. They don't want to be the next Darren Wilson, who, by the way, was cleared under the rule of law. And I remind people all the time, too, you're entitled to due process in the United States of America. You are not entitled to an outcome. You may not like what the grand jury did in New York with Eric Garner. I had some problems with it, but for a different reason. I wouldn't have sent the cops there to begin with for selling Lucy cigarettes. I would have said, tell them to send the State Department of Revenue over there. <laughs> Why do we have cops doing tax collection work? You see what I mean when I say we get them out of there, you know, what they're really good at and what they're trained to do? We have them now performing tax collection work. We're cops. We're not tax collectors. If you don't, you send the cop. Remember I said, a lot can go wrong in a hurry. 
They had to take Eric Garner to jail. Eric Garner said, I'm not going to jail. Oh, yes, he was going to jail. And had he just put his hands behind his back like the officer said, you heard the, the audio, turn around and put your hands behind your back. If he'd have done that, Eric Garner would be alive today. But when they don't put their hands behind their back, you have to use force. And then everybody wants to get real technical. Well, why didn't they? This doesn't work like that in our world. The guy's going to jail. Now, it has to be reasonable, right? You can't pick him up by his ankles and start pounding it. That's not reasonable. But you all know what reasonable looks like. And then let the rule of law do its work. And more times than not, we're going to get the benefit of the doubt. People want to know, why was the cops always exonerated? Because of the rule of law. If we don't like it, then we should change the rule of law. You don't go after the cop for criminal prosecution. So this is what we're up against. These, this is, we're going to win this. We won it in the 60s, the war on cops. We won it. It's going to take some time, but somebody's got to be out there defending the American police officer. I'm doing what I can. I'll do the heavy lifting. I just need you folks to cover my flanks and watch against sneak attacks and lay on your political leaders to back off these people, the cops. As Thomas Sowell said, I met Thomas Sowell recently, one of the highlights of my career. A guy, I, I read a lot of his works. He and I had been communicating by email, and finally I went out to see him. Thomas Sowell says, it's real simple. If you're going to have law, you must have law enforcement. That's us. Otherwise, you don't have law. So I want to close with just a couple things here for you to go away with, just to keep in mind. This is good. Many of you are at that age. You remember Peter Falk, Colombo. You can just see him saying this. Now let me see if I have this right. The family situation is so unstable, Junior doesn't even know where to send a Father's Day card. There's no guidance or discipline in the home. Junior gets dumped into the education system where he is socially promoted because the overwhelmed school district can't deal with the undisciplined whelp. Junior's major formative influence are gangster rap videos and a corresponding peer group of gangster wannabes. At age 18, Junior is turned loose on society, carrying a bad attitude, a broken compass, and little respect for authority. Junior gets himself into big trouble, trouble with the law and meets with dire consequences. Then the situational diagnosis is that the police need more training and understanding. <laughs> Pardon me for asking, but do you really believe that bullshit? <laughs> That's the heart of it. You've all seen that. Your president of the United States draping himself with a couple of law enforcement lackeys and coming up with this 21st century task force to transform this profession. And like I said, he's never done this work a day in his life. I don't want him transforming his profession. We have policing in America right. It's not perfect. It can't be because it involves human beings, and human beings aren't perfect. But we get it right, and we're not as corrupt as some nation's police forces. All right, we better be real careful in letting people totally turn this profession upside down on its, on its head because of an aberration like Laquan McDonald in Chicago. I see teachers now that are being charged with having inappropriate sex with their students. I haven't heard anybody say that we need to transform the profession of teaching. No, we deal with those bad teachers. That's the last one was for another day. Baltimore, Maryland. Can you imagine what the cops must have been feeling after watching that? in real time, their cruiser. 
We live in those cars. We work in those cars. They afford us protection. There are offices. Riot starters. People like to paint cops with this broad brush. They're all racist, right? Anarchists. Don't be fooled by these. They're not protesters, by the way. This is insurrection. That's what I said recently on TV. When I hear these things, Black Lives Matter, the only people who really believe that are American police officers who go into the American ghettos every day to keep people from killing each other. When you see the black-on-black -black homicide that happens on a very frequent basis, we don't see protests, we don't see marches, and we don't see demands for change. If black lives, if they really mattered, that's where the outrage would be, that's where we'd see the protests. And like I said, these people are nowhere to be found. I'm proud of these guys. I say guys neutrally. Proud of these men and women that come in here every day under these difficult circumstances. Even before now, it was still a difficult job. It's just been made more difficult. No respect for authority. Again, anarchists. And we're supposed to want to sit down and what, have a discussion with these folks? You gotta be kidding me. More dialogue, the president says, with these, with these people? The misuse of data and statistics about police officer use of force when it comes to black male, you know what the narrative is right now? Well, you know, we, we killed law enforcement officers are quick to use force on black males, and this is not true. There's no data or research, and I've read it all, there's no data or research that support this. Here's one report, Dr. Timothy Johnson, notice in the right-hand corner there, I, I always cite this stuff where I got it from. By two to one margin, more white males are killed in police interactions than black males. Where's all the screaming from the white males? They might have a claim, but yet we hear the opposite. Meant to be humorous, but it's not. Eric Holder with his anti-police rhetoric. And here's about this guy on the right. Was killed last week, police use of force in the city of Chicago. And it resulted in Black Lives Matter converging on the city of Chicago last week, took over a part of the interstate system for this guy. This guy's mom, after he was shot and killed, the guy on the right. And you know what, I get moms. I just do. You love your children. No matter what, I get that. But she stood up there and said, my child didn't have to be shot like that. He was a good kid. Look at him. I'm not blaming her. I'm saying Black Lives Matter gathered for this killing last week, yet last summer, nine-year-old Tyshawn Lee, black kid, nine years old, was lured out into an alley and shot and killed by his dad's rival gang member. There were no protests by Black Lives Matter when Tyshawn Lee, at nine years old, was gunned down. And they're going to rally for this guy? We're scraping the bottom of the barrel, folks. I'm not saying this guy deserved to die, but he, they, it's alleged. And trust me, that's the word you have to use. He pointed a handgun at a Chicago police officer, told him to drop and he wouldn't, the police officer shot him. They recovered the, the gun at the scene. It probably happened. And his mom said he didn't have to die, to which my response was, and not to be mean, 
but you've got to stop these false. Why are we embracing this as he's a good kid? He's not a good kid. Look at him. We have to stop embracing this stuff. That's what I meant. I meant to be mean to her, but I said, maybe if you'd have done a better job of parenting, he might not have turned out that way. I said, might. You can't, we, we cannot, I'm not going to allow people to embrace it. He's a good kid. Look at him. This guy is stone cold gangster. He's not a good kid. Things were not going to end up right at some point in this guy's life. Maybe another rival gang member or shot in a drug deal. He wasn't going to live that long. The leading cause of death, black males under 25, homicide. You know what it is for other dem demographics? Under 25, leading cause of death, white males, accidents. Homicide, ladies and gentlemen, leading cause of death. Lifestyle choices. Remember when I said, I tell young people, make better lives. He made a lifestyle choice. He chose thug life. He made that. And then I hear all this stuff about how uh, the cops got to do a better job of, of improving their relationship with the community. It's a lie. No, we don't. Here's a Rasmussen poll. Nobody would accuse Rasmussen of being this pro-cop group, right? So they did a survey. This came out two weeks ago. What America thinks, good cop, bad cop. There's a war on police in America. Nearly 60% of people agreed with that, that were polled. Crime in urban areas is a greater problem than police discrimination. 70% of those polls said, yeah, crime's a bigger problem. Political comments critical of police are increasing the danger. 60% of those polls said, yeah, this war on cops is hurting. And here's the, my favorite. Police performance, good or excellent, 72% of those polls said, yeah, we like our police. It's not perfect. It's nowhere near 100, right? Show me somebody else who has numbers, approval numbers like that. But there's a false narrative out there that's dominating, and then people say, well, the police have to change. That's not what these folks are saying. They're saying the ghetto has to change. And then there's another one. 31 mayors across the country from last year surveyed, wanted to know uh, how they rate their police department's relationship with minority communities. Mayors know, right? Add those two top figures together. 78% of these 31 mayors across the country said their police department's relationship with minority communities is excellent or good. Why are we hearing this false narrative? Cops are racist and they hate black people. The mayors don't think so. And so we should change this profession for that bottom line there. 10% of, of those mayors polled here said it's poor. You don't change an entire industry or profession because of that. That's called an outlier on the bottom. You disregard that. When I talk about the rules, the st statistics that get ignored, and the manipulation of data, that's called an outlier. You throw it out. We're going to change the profession because 78% of these mayors said it's pretty good with minority communities. They said white community, minority community. That means these mayors had to have minority communities in their city to even answer that question. So don't think they got these from all these suburban areas because they don't have minority communities. So that's the false narrative that I'm going to continue to push back against until we win this war on cops. And we're going to win it, ladies and gentlemen. We have to for the survival of America. Now, I don't know how I, how I did on time. I, don't worry about that. I was told about 40 minutes or so and 15 minutes for Q&A. And the way I looked at it, I said, I got 55 minutes. I'll apportion it the way I want to. <laughs> and I've been doing this long enough that I've learned a thing or two. And the less time you leave for questions, the less trouble you can get into. <laughs> but um, no, I wanted to give you your money's worth. And um, if we don't get to questions, it's fine. It's just the way it goes. Uh, hang in there, folks, OK? I know these are some very precarious 
times that we're living in, but I believe in the resilience of America. I really do. Uh, this country's been through a lot. Been through a revolution. Went through a constitutional convention where the United States Constitution almost didn't pass ratification by the states. You know about the Federalist, paper, Federalist Papers and the role that played trying to convince some of these states to go along with the Constitution. The Constitution wasn't perfect, but it got it right. All right, my ancestors weren't included in the Constitution. We weren't considered people. We were considered property. But guess what? Because I still believe in the brilliance of that document. They put a mechanism in there to eventually get it right. We can amend the Constitution, and we did. Don't forget, the United States Supreme Court did not end slavery. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution ended slavery. And the 14th Amendment insisted that the states allow the entire Constitution to apply to my ancestors. That's the brilliance of that document. We can change it, we can get it right. We've been through a civil war. Can you imagine living at that time thinking this nation was going to survive? Probably thinking of a lot of what I hear today. I don't know how we're going to do it. And I believe in the resilience of this country. We survived the Civil War. America came out stronger and better, right? We survived two world wars. Two world wars. This country. We survived the turbulent 60s. We thought it was falling apart. And that we'd never get it back on track. And we did. We always come out better. We survived 9-11. We survived the Great Depression. Think of this. We have a tendency as humans to, to only look recently to use as a basis for, you know, are we ever going to get out of this? Are we ever going it's to? It's a resilient country. It's a resilient country because of its people, not its political class, not its government, because of its people. And as long as we don't give up, We'll bounce back from this. Ladies and gentlemen, we survived Jimmy Carter. <laughs> so we will survive Barack Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, God bless you. Thank you so much. And may God continue to bless the United States of America.